Uh, welcome to our fireside chat. This is Bruce Anderson. <clears throat> I met Bruce, oh, 10 or 12 years ago at Stonehouse when he was then just finishing up his little foray in the basement of the courthouse, checking out the papers and filing them. Filing them, he's a great man. <laughs> he knows more about Cobb than I think anybody else in the world, and he's going to tell us a little bit about it. It's all yours, Bruce. Hey. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to quit now. <laughs> um, I'm not an expert. I'm just a lot very curious. And what we've got here, and I would like to talk about the town of Cobb. And uh, and that Cobb, uh, just recently, most people believe that John Cobb established the town of Cobb. He didn't. First off, Cobb is not a town. Cobb is either a village or a community, or as the federal government likes to put it, a point of census. <laughs> it has never been laid out as a town and probably will never be a town. But I use the word town because I'm comfortable with it. And when I say town, everybody knows exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> if I say community, it could be anywhere up on the mountain. But so I'll be going in and I'll refer to the town of Cobb, just that everybody knows it really isn't a town, it's something else. Now, one other thing that you'll notice on that is state used to put up of road signs on uh, towns and communities, and they would list the population and the elevation and what it is. Uh, both of those signs that are on Cobbs are gone. They've been removed. Uh, one of them they just sold off the top, whether somebody stole it or whatever, but the state hasn't replaced it. Now, so okay, on that, so now we come in to Cobb. Now John Cobb uh, and the post office, which is normally where you establish a community, it's fun when you get a post office. Middletown has a little history before it, but once it gets the post office, then it becomes the center. That's where everything else is on the olden days. Now the Cobb post office was established in 1911, very late compared to everybody else. And so John Cobb, he came into the valley in 1853. And he settled a mile and a half down Lower Rock Road off a of Nutmeg Creek there. He settled on the west bank. It's almost where you, the turn for Sawmill Road goes up. And uh, he then, but he left in 1859 with Cobb Valley. He still was in the county, he was down here in Middletown, and he eventually got a large ranch between uh, Lower Lake and Middletown. But he, uh, and so that's, when he left Cobb, that is 52 years before Cobb was even established. And then John Cobb died in, in let's see, We'll have that. But he was 79, and that's 16 years after Cobb is established. So John Cobb is the emperor, emperor state, is this, uh, what we named the place, but he was, he did not establish it. So now we have to come back to why is Cobb there? Well, Cobb's there because of a road. And that's kind of my little specialty, because I used to work for the county and the state, and I played around trying to find out all the information I could on roads. And the early information on roads is very sketchy and very hard to come by. And I have a whole bunch of stuff here that I'm going to leave for the library, the maps and things that I've accomplished, and that's what we're going to kind of go through. So, on, on the road, I'm kind of biased at it. I'm saying that civilization has to have a road to be there. 
big tech. You have to be able to get by and get there. Somebody said to me, well, San Francisco's got a port. Yeah, but they have a road inside. You gotta unload it and gotta take it away on a road. <coughs> you gotta bring the stuff to ship it. But you can, and besides being a road, which we could not, a road is just a static piece of property. It has to be built by people, <clears throat> has to be wanted by people, has to be needed by people. And that's something I kind of fight against. I like the status where I don't have to worry about people. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so that's what we've got. And so now I kind of look at uh, history now as kind of a mystery. So we know that uh, Cobb, the town of Cobb, was not established by Cobb established after he died and everything. Now how did we get the, uh, the, why was there a town or a community there now? And why is it named Cobb? So if we just kind of look at it as a mystery and kind of go through it. Now the first thing that came back is years ago, we had a history talk on Cobb. And Mr. Hinton here, gave a talk on John Cobb, because he's a relative of John Cobb. And in that talk, we were all going around and very busy, and he mentioned that John Cobb came because there was an Indian treaty, and he heard they were not going to ratify the Indian treaty. I never thought a thing about it. Went home that night, popped up in bed, what Indian treaty? Never heard of it. It's not mentioned in the history book. There's nobody seemed to know about it. I've never heard about it before. So the next day, made my, I lost a lot of sleep from you. <laughs> but anyway, the next day I went to the library in Lakeport to have an Indian exhibit there. They never heard of it either, or they couldn't tell me about it. Went to the historical site. They couldn't tell me where it was. Then I, then I, there was a nice lady there said, oh yeah, and it's on the internet. You want me to print it out for you? And I said, yes. So she printed out the Indian treaty. And here's a copy of it, which we're going to have here. And it is a part, there were 18, it turns out, there were 18 trees. A fellow named McKee, Colonel McKee, was the Indian agent for the government. And he started down at Los Angeles and he made treaties as he came up. And the treaty he got here was Treaty O. And um, there's a, and it, it's really an interesting treaty. And what happened was, is they went and they set a spur of the land that goes out into Clear Lake, which is uh, Canuck, uh, which is uh, 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 Buckingham. Hmm? Buckingham? Bu yeah, Buckingham Point there. And from there, there was a line that went up to the top of Cobb, came around on the, the ridge that separated the waters that came to Clear Lake from the Russian River, went across the air uh, there, and went even across the, the, the uh, other side, and separated the waters that went into Clear Lake from the waters that went into the Yale River. That took in care of uh, uh, roughly one third of all of Lake County today, which was a tremendous piece of uh, undertaking and changed a lot of people's lives. Unfortunately, what happened is the treaties all went back to Washington to the Senate and they were not ratified. Settlers voted, Indians didn't vote. So, but uh, in that treat, this treaty actually what it did is it made all the Native Americans in Lake County, probably everywhere, but Lake County I know about, landless. That means that you had an Indian family that had been living, say, in Middletown for 400 years, all their relatives. The settlers would come in. The government had cut up all the property into sections and was selling it and homesteading it. And the guy that bought that property would go to the Indian family and says, this is my land. You, you go. He said, where do I go? You go to that Indian reservation up in uh, Cobb. Well, this was Lakeport, Scotts Valley, Kelseyville. It, it was a big area. And 
when they came up there, the settlers would say, oh, no, no, you don't have it here. You go someplace else. Meanwhile, the government was selling the property that they let for a treaty and homesteading the property to settlers. What year was the treaty? So in effect, no Native American had a, had a home until 1909. They were just homeless. And what year was the treaty, Bruce? Pardon me? What year was the treaty written? The written, um, uh, It was probably written in about 1951. Uh, well, they, some, 1851. Well, besides the treaty, the reason this treaty was in is because of another treaty. And that's my problem that I have to boot all these notes because I just keep going and finding everything. But the treaty would be signed at the end of the Mexican War. The United States agreed to treat the Native Americans fairly. Something they never <laughs> did, but they yeah. And they were supposed to, and that's why they did all these treaties. But the the government really had no desire to honor any of the treaties. So, and then what happened is, so this is the first. It's a it's a three page uh, document. It's they were basically trying to make the Native Americans settlers. They wanted they were trying to convert them, and I always liked it. They gave them an American flag. You know, whatever but uh, it's here it'll be so if anybody really wants to look at it being part of the can you show it up to the camera <laughs> <laughs> thank you it's on the internet you if probably was really interested they could just get and pick up all 18 trees and find what they did all in california wow. i was just interested in lake county so that was that and so then uh now, then the, the Rancheria Appropriations Act of 1906 then finally decided that the Native Americans had nothing. They were just being kicked around forever. And they went around and they bought land uh, to make the rancherias <coughs> that we know today. Now, the present rancheria down here was in 1912. They bought very bad property <laughs> at that time and they turned and in fact they were saying there only be between five and ten percent of the property you could be cultivated and then they established the rancherias all over and then the natives Americans could have at least some place that they could be which they had not been told so that 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 document made all these Native Americans homeless and it's not something. And the, the worst part of it is that nobody <coughs> would own up that they made the treaty. They denied the treaty was ever there. Was ever there. That they ever had a treaty. It's, and it, if you get the uh, history book of Lake County, it's not even listed. I think something that affected one third of Lake County should have been listed in the history book. It's not. It's not in Malden's records. Nobody, the settlers didn't really want to say that that's what they did. But that's what happened. And so that's the very first deal. So, so now we know that that's why John Cobb came to Cobb. He knew because he was living in Napa. He knew that they weren't going to ratify the treaty. He was politically clerk, uh, connected with everybody. He also became an uh, assessor for the Crow Lake Township because at that time, this, there was no Lake County either. It was Napa County. Mm -hmm. We were in Napa County. But then, how did he know about Cobb Valley? Because when he came, he specifically came up to come right into Cobb Valley. He hacked his way up and got it right to Cobb Valley. He didn't go to any place else. He went to Cobb Valley. Now, why did he want to come to Cobb Valley? That brings us to Stone and Kelsey on the Kelseyville deal. We've heard of the Kelseyville Ma um, Bloody Island and the Kelseyville Massacre. Well, Stone and Kelsey were not very nice people, according to what I read. 
and they mistreated the Native Americans pretty bad. And so in uh, 1848, the Indians rebuilt down there in Kelseyville. And it turns out that one friendly Indian ran down the Indian trail and notified uh, Kelsey's brothers. And there's, well, there, there's more people, I won't read them all. But there were seven people, two of them were Kelsey's brothers, that rode consistently up here. They made the trip from Napa to Cobb Valley, or to Kelseyville, in 36 hours. And they, they came across what they called the Indian Trail. Now, they, and the Indian Trail, they could ride two abreast horses. So that means that the Indian Trail was not a trail like we normally uh, view a trail as, but it was a road. It was the first road that the Native Americans used to go from place to place because if they had to go, say, to the ocean for a trading trip, they packed up almost everybody and they took out. Through there, they, of course, left a lot of people that couldn't make the trip, but it was a great deal. So that is, right now, the first record of a borough we have is the Indian Trail, which basically is Bottle Rock Road. It moves around, but that's where Bottle Rock Road comes. So when they came up there, they, of course, chastised the Native Americans and killed a bunch of them and left. And, of course, Kelsey and Stone didn't learn their lesson, and they still kept doing what they did. And they had another revolt. This time, Stone and Kelsey didn't make it, and they killed them. Then the word got back to the brothers and all the people in Napa that this was an outrage, could not be taken, couldn't have it anymore. So they came up and they brought boats up and they brought cannons and an army and everything. They didn't ever go back to Kelseyville. They stopped in Middletown and went over to Bloody Island, killed a lot of the Native Americans, and they weren't satisfied, so they went all the way down the Russian River killing as many as they could. And at that time, the army estimate was they killed 500, which is probably way under what it actually was. And the Indians that actually killed in Stone and Kelsey, nobody ever showed up for that. Just somebody innocent. innocent. So now we know when they came back <coughs> to the Napa, they had glowing stories about <coughs> the beauty of Cobb Valley, of all the hunting, all the animals and everything. It was, it's a beautiful place. And so now Cobb knew that they weren't going to ratify the Indian Treaty. He knew there was a Cobb Valley, and he came. And so, now, <coughs> and so what I want to get is, and we want to stop a little about Cobb, because everybody knows a lot more about Cobb than I do. But the main uh, place of business in Cobb was Glenbrook. That's about three miles, three and a half miles, down from Cobb. There actually is a sign right at the middle of Bar Rock Road saying <coughs> Pine Grove, Gordon Springs, Jordan Park, and Glenbrook. And the state put that sign up and it's, you can hardly read any of the letters. In fact, I, I had the contract to put it up <coughs> when I worked for the state. Anyway, so they got that, but Glenbrook was a real big place. And I want to give you just a little brief history of that because you were very fortunate you have a fellow in the audience here, Mark, who's going to write a history of Glenbrook. Mm -hmm. He's lived there, he's got more pictures, and he's read, hopefully, within a short period of time, he'll have a book for us on everything on Glenbrook. But I'll just spoil it a little bit, <laughs> what's your appetite? Now, it was the main community center down there. It had a Wells Fargo office, had a telegraph, it had a business community of 26 people. In fact, my relatives signed the business directory. That was the big community. It had a resort and it had a stage show. And in fact, Mark showed me a while back, about eight years ago, the stage stop building is still there. It could be the oldest building in Lake County. It's a big building where they put the stage in and on one side there's a dormitory for the women and a dormitory for men on top. Anyway, 
I won't push anything more, but I think you can look forward to that. Where was that again? Glenbrook? Pardon? Where was Glenbrook? Where? Glenbrook is about three and a half miles down Bottle Rock Road, just before you cross uh, Kelsey Creek again. Alder Creek is in there. It, it, it had a, a hardware store there, had a donut store later on. Uh, back over the bridge is where all the buildings were back in there. Oh, okay. It, 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 it's a beautiful place. Is that almost down near where the campground was? Yogi Bear campground? Yeah, before you come to right. there. Right. Right. And uh, it's, uh, uh, there are early records that it, when Cobb came in, that's where the main Indian village was. <clears throat> That's the prime piece of property at that time in Cobb Valley. Other pieces, you know, when times get they get more prime if you're looking for something. But at that time of the, uh, of the century, uh, for had uh, three creeks running through it, had flat ground, beautiful in there. It was just perfect for the Native Americans to set up their their place. There's others, but that was the main one. Anyway, so now I then came and let's see. Uh, I, when I retired, I started, well, I've been working, but I thought I could really get a lot of stuff, <laughs> which I haven't done and never been made. But I pestered the county offices and the road department and the sheriff's department because at one time I used to work there and about where to get stuff and what we could have. And so what they had given me was, you got to again, the county was not, when I worked for the county in 47, the budget in the surveyor's office for all equipment, all material and everything was $50. Oh, dear. So you can imagine that a lot of things didn't get done and didn't get followed. Great. And one of the times that I was in there, uh, we did a lot of maps and had to color out voting districts and everything. And you outline them in a little red pencil. And, and uh, I had a little red pencil that was this big. And I thought, hell, I should have a bigger pencil. I, you know, I should have. So I went down to Tracy's uh, surveyor's, uh, Frank Johnson's office, and Tracy Scott was in there. And I asked for a bigger red pencil <laughs> to outline. And she went through her old desk, and never found a red pencil. The Frank went through his desk and he found a pencil that was this big. <laughs> so I got this big one, but I had to surrender this one. Oh, man. And it went back in to the deal. Uh, and and this, well, this Tracy Scott also, I, well, I'm getting off my track, but uh, was very eccentric. And she would, uh, had an adding machine. She ran the paper through the adding machine four times. Oh. So when she gave you a list, you had to be careful which one, you, which side you were looking at, oh, wow. because she had the white paper. But it run through, you could turn the paper. She'd rip off the paper and turn it around. She wouldn't go through a whole row and then do the other side and did it four times. She also had a little red pickup, and she went to the dump all the time, picking up everything. This will come in later when we talk about how I think we got papers. And she'd go to the garbage dump and pick up everything she could get. And one time she showed me her house. She had two houses in Lakeport on the same lot, double story house and a little house. Well, that double story house was converted into a museum of everything that she probably salvaged in Lake County. And I can remember that she had about the size of that box over there a dresser, and that dresser was completely full of buttons, oh, just no. buttons. Oh my. So you can imagine, and of course, I was younger then, I didn't pay much attention to a lot of this stuff, so you can imagine what was in that house. Mm. 
But anyway, so when I went to uh, look at the county records, I, they had this document, which I'm uh, donating to you. It's uh, number 29. It's for an abandoning a portion of the county road up near Sigler Springs. I mean, yeah, Sig uh, no, Adam Springs. Adam Springs, I'm sorry. Adam Springs. And it was Dr. Prather. Now, you've probably all heard of Dr. Prather. Well, at that time, when this was done, Dr. Prather and Boggs ran Lake County. And uh, he wanted to abandon a piece of this road that went down through his resort and, and go to something else. Anyway, he put in the petition, and then this is a record that the county clerks used to use that they would write, because everything went through the clerk. And also, what it did is, if you wanted anything done, You've always heard that you can petition the government. Well, it doesn't mean much to us now, but in those days, everything was a petition. Everything they did was a petition. You signed a petition for something, somebody put in a petition against it. Somebody did this. There were, uh, in some of the stuff, there were uh, petitions to ban cars in Lake County. Oh, wow. And there's a petition to not ban cars. And, <laughs> and so you can tell who is for everything by who signed the petitions. So a lot of this was this, and then these are the, the dates that they did. And anyway, they came that they were going to abandon uh, this property. Now another thing that I got in when I was doing that, <coughs> there's a road from Cobb up to Holberg's, and which is now a highway uh, set 175. That was not always 175. But the stagecoach went down. It, it's called, uh, there was in there what they call the cutoff road. But anyway, the stagecoach went down to Glenbrook, came up over the deal, down to Glenbrook, went up to uh, and around to uh, Adam Springs, and then came back to Holbrook's. So at that time, people, uh, all your visitors and everything would get off at the best resort, and they were always unhappy as heck about the trip. Yeah. I mean, it was not a nice trip. In fact, I'll read you a letter here from a lady who describes the trip from Calistoga <laughs> to the Oaks. Uh oh, wow. Six hours. Anyway, so this comes along, and this was so what uh, Max Holberg did, which is the father, he decided that if he built a road from Cobb, actually there was a cutoff, uh, the Bill Road from Cobb up to his resort and then on to Adam Springs, the stagecoaches would kill the passengers off at their place and not go to Adam's. And Mrs. Hobart was a very great cook. And they had great pies and food and everything. And they were banking on. And, they, and of course, uh, Dr. Prather didn't like that too much because <laughs> he would get just the leftovers coming on. And so they were against this. So we got this 30. And so he puts it in in uh, 1904. And I'm not going to go into too much detail here because the records that I found go into a lot more detail on this. This is just cleaning it up. This is what the county had officially that they have now. And then it comes down, and it comes down and continue, 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 and it just goes on forever. <laughs> and finally, then I lose, the, lose it in... Uh, 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 doesn't matter. Anyway, I lose it and I can't find any records. I just can't. They're, they're just gone. So that was this one. Mm -hmm. Also, when the county, I was able to find these records. 
Now these are records that are much later than these. There's a whole gap in everything that went along. But this was in the county official records. They do have that. And so this is the, and on the one for Cobb, uh, it is it's in, by a petition by a fellow named Sports had an ice plant up there. Now no longer Hobart anymore. This and this is actually the plan of the road. So if you were now down at Harvester's Market is down around here. The fire took out this, and if you look up going up the road, you'll see a little piece of road in here in the dirt. That is the only piece that's left of this road that's here. But it's actually, that is part of the original road that was built in 1904. But anyway, this is when they did it again, then they came in with a survey, and this is the actual surveys, and these are the meets and bounds, or the uh, bearings and the distances on this road. And of course, nobody would really be interested in that kind of stuff. But anyway, that's what they had on that. And then, on this one, this we talked about the abandonment of the road by Prathers. What happened is, when he went and put in to abandon this road, people who didn't like Dr. Prather or didn't, their business interests weren't being served by <laughs> F here, filed a petition to be against it. <laughs> so, but, and then, and actually we'll get into what he had to do. And then this is the old road and then the new road. So he had to maintain, post a bond and everything to maintain this road. This, this is a little tick for tat that happens in politics all the time. But anyway, this is a map that was in the county surveyor's office. Now, also in those maps, this is a map of 1892, just a portion of the, the bottom map that's there. And the road going to Hoburg's is not on that map. Hoburg's isn't even listed on that map. We lived on a place, uh, Gordon Springs, which is an old resort. There, it's listed. So, but it doesn't matter. But, so that is, and then, then, then there's a map that my grandmother had of <coughs> 18, 99, which basically shows the same thing. Hold it up. So, well, you can't see anything on it anyway. I mean, you really got to get down with a magnifying glass on this whole But I mean, it's just that it's here, and uh, the library would make it available for anybody that wanted to look at it, that you could see where they are. It also shows a lot of the stuff that's down around the Middletown area and around. But these are just maps that are not common. They're, they just don't have them. And also, well, this map, this map, I'm getting a little ahead, is where I went and got these out of blocks in the county hall. This is called the cutoff road. And this is, and it shows a lot of the map areas where they went around. But this is the, uh, Cut off road that they wanted to get. 
it lit, this is a hand-blown map by the surveyor of Lake County at that time. It's, as far as I know, until I started passing out copies, nobody even knew it was there. But anyway, so... Another thing that I found, in, and it's like I told you that I had worked for the county. They hired me uh, when we did the Rodman Bridge. Uh, Barney Barnwell, I don't know if anybody knows him. Anyway, he was a registered engineer. County didn't have an engineer, so they hired him to do uh, five bridges. And they hired me to be his assistant. And I started to learn how to do bridges and roads and things. Not very good, but I worked at it. But anyway, uh, and one of the things all the time that I worked for the state and worked for the county, nobody could tell me how they did old roads. It was an old county road, yeah, they got that. It was a, a toll road, we uh, got that. But I never knew how they got the roads. The only thing I could really ever come up with was around uh, Finley area, you'll see the old county road, which used to be the state highway, 90 degree turns. That is because those are section lines, and what they did, the owner of this property gave a little bit of the property on his edge, and the owner of this property gave a little bit on his edge, so they're all 90 degree turns. And that's how that worked. So you, every time you can go back and see a road that makes a 90 degree turn and then goes down maybe a uh, thousand feet, makes another 90 degree turn, goes maybe up a little bit, that is, you can pick your bottom dollar, that's on a, a line for a town, or not a township, but a section, or a quarter of a section, or some kind of a line, that that's how I said. But I did run into this one piece that was just, they had, and it tells me, uh, that you can have viewers. I never knew you could have viewers or whatever. But anyway, this is what I originally got from the county. It's just a, it's a political code. It says I, what they did everywhere was everything was Now, if you're <laughs> one of the nice things that surprises many people is if you had a county road, you were expected to work on that county road. There was no county force that maintained the road or did anything. You were expected, every man, everybody between 18 and 50 was required and they called it kind of a poll tax deal. And these are certificates that you got from a roadmaster. They, had, they formed different districts, and then you would get in. And so the roadmaster would say, OK, well, notify the people around. We're going to improve this piece of property this time. You're responsible to come with your buggy and put in a full day's work. And it turned out that it turns out into two, and then they, they vary. They're, they two days work, and sometimes they were three days work. Mm -hmm. That's pick and shovel work. Wow. Now, a lot of do a doctor didn't want to do pick and shovel. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd run the grocery store didn't want to do pick and shovel work. So they could pay a dollar and a half and three dollars, depending upon when it came, to satisfy your poll tax. And there was a lot of disagreement between the people and the roadmaster about who did what and however. And we have a couple of those. Well, I have one of those in here where there's a disagreement where they're trying to remove the, uh, the roadmaster. All with a petition. We'll can do it. But anyway, the, uh, so this was pretty hard work. And it, so if you complain about the roads, you know, the guys aren't out there cleaning your gutters for you. In the past, boy, you cleaned them yourself. And, and you did it all. 
Now the toll road was different. And the toll road, and there were all sorts of different toll roads, very hard to get. You know, we, the, the toll road that went uh, from Middletown to Lakeport was called the Boggs Toll Road. So that means they got a charter, and I have not been able to get all the information to find it out. I get little pieces here and there. But a toll road can be authorized by either the county or by the state, depending upon, and I don't know exactly how it did, but there were a lot of toll roads. And anyway, he made the Boggs Toll Road, and I have deeds that show that this the Boggs Toll Road coming through the area. And I'll, I'll skip a little ahead now that we're on that. Bottle, let's take Bottle Rock Road. Bottle Rock Road started as the Indian Trail. Came up to Ford Flat and came down. Wasn't necessarily the highway we have now. And, uh, and it went in the general area. You can't say that the Indian Trail is completely what it is now, but it was in, it's basically there. In, in fact, the county road uh, used to run under my brother's house. It's got a house built on top of it. But a lot of the road's been abandoned, and when I work, say, on roads, I can't drive anywhere without looking down and seeing where all the old roads are to be bypassed out the sections. If you go over St. Helena, it's a field day sitting out there looking down and seeing where that road went down in each one of those, came back up, and now we just drive across it. But you had all those, and on the, the toll road, then, so you had the county road. So Bottle Rock actually started, I believe, as the Indian Trail. I'm not sure. I think it was a county or a road or before that. Then it became the Boggs Toll Road which means that they collected money from you every time you used the road. So if you wanted to bring your horse up or some cattle or whatever, a wagon, so much money. Who collected the money? The county? Huh? Did the county collect the money? No, the guy that did the uh, box. Box. Or the toll road. Yeah. They had a, in fact, well, come to it. They had a franchise to do it. Ooh. And so they collected the money. And they got it usually for so many years. Mm -hmm. uh, San Alina was the law. Uh, well, Boggs also built a toll road uh, over Mount San Alina. Mm -hmm. And then it was turned into the law, 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 toll road. And the county, in, uh, county of Lake and the county of Napa bought that toll road and made it a county road, and then which basically became a state highway. But now that we have the county road, uh, then it, let's see, uh, it was the toll road, then it became a county road, which we have the documents to show it, and then it actually became the state highway. That was actually State Highway 29. And then when Holbergs became more powerful and the resorts on the hill, all the resorts on the hill. That was just a county road going up there. They got the road changed from Bottle Rock to the road that goes through, which is 175 now, which is 29 at that time, and Bottle Rock then became a county road. Now, when in Middletown here, the road from Middletown to Lower Lake was only a county road because I can remember working on sections for the state, bringing it up to state standards. When the, when the road from Middletown to Lower Lake was brought to state standards, they converted Highway 29 from the mountain to down here. And that became Highway 29, and the, mountain, and the road up there became 175. So those are just the way that, that it functions around. No, I'm not sure. But, uh, there's a lady here, and I have where this came from on the email. My daughter gave me this. 
This was a lady that lived, came over here from England. And she settled up by uh, Curlick Highlands over there. And she had a habit of referring to all of everybody I was interested in and just initials. <laughs> but she kept track of what it costs to do everything. If it, she would come back and say, uh, a nail cost this much, and she'd write it down in her letter since she had back to England. And yeah. that's where they salvaged her letters and put them on the internet. Oh, wow. And she was very unhappy that people that were building a house for her were spitting on the floor. <laughs> I mean, but I mean, if you wanted to know what the everyday deal, she would tell you exactly what it cost to build a well, exact, because they were in that time, she was always talking about capital. It was, it was back in an older age than you are now. It's like if you read a Victorian novel. That's what it is. And she would then uh, talk about everything imaginable that I wasn't really interested in, but the price of everything. So if, if a person was an historian or something and really wanted to know what it was like, then her records are priceless. And I think that you can access them on this coat, because that's where my daughter got it from. She also wrote one time, I can remember, uh, she said uh, it had just rained in the fall. She said it rained heavy all night. She opened the door and she says it was a beautiful sight. She could actually see the, the, the hills and they weren't covered by solid smoke. Oh, wow. He said the hills were all black, but the hill to that, and what it meant was Lake County burned all summer long here in oh, those years. And that's what she had, and she was really impressed with it. Anyway, this is the letter that she wrote about her trip up here, which, and said, if I can remember, right. we left San Francisco at 8 a.m., and after crossing the bay, and the steam ferry, we came to, by railroad to Calistoga, and from thence had to drive for six hours on a stage. You never saw such a ramshackle old vehicle in your life. It was a wagon with some sort of springs, I believe, and two seats, each large enough for two, into which crammed six people. I never was shaken uh, in my life, for the road was awful and quite precipitous as any in Switzerland and rough to the bargain. For six hours I held on like grim death to the post next to me till my hand was cramped and stiff. We were flung up and down again like peas and the dust was suffocating. <laughs> so that's what it used to be like to get And Okay, so now we come to the... Oh, one more thing. Here's a copy of all the stage lines. Uh -huh. And where they were. They're in orange of all the different state lines. And this was in 1909. Oh, wow. So this listed the state, the different stage lines. I thought it'd be an interesting map for somebody to look at. And then I got to around and still couldn't find what I wanted. And was and the surveyor and the engineers there were, were friends of mine. And you know, I kept bugging them. I got a lot of other stuff on surveying and everything, but that, that was the extent of what I could get from the county on roads from the official. And the surveyor says, you know, I think I got something in the vault. It has something about do about roads. <laughs> well, yeah. So I went in there, started looking through that, and there were a lot of stuff there. There is the original contract to build the courthouse. There is the original contract to furnish the courthouse. There is the original contract to uh, put a uh, outhouse in the courthouse lawn and pipe the sewage down to Clearwater. 
<laughs> there are the original documents on how welfare was done. Oh, wow. It was done by a petition. They had to have 10 people to sign the petition that this lady or man or something deserved to be on the dole. That's where the expression on the dole comes from, to receive and the board of supervisors. And you had to certify that they were drunk. Oh, wow. The county was. So, anyway, there's a whole bunch of those documents in there on that. There's actually one document signed by two ladies. They're the daughter of one guy that they put on the dole. And they're saying to the nasty letter to the Board of Supervisors, we'll take care of our father. We don't want your money. <laughs> and, but anyway, they got, so they had a whole pile of that stuff. But in that pile, they had road records, stuff that I had never seen that told me how they built all the old roads. Not all of them, nothing is complete, just a little, there's just one little, and luckily they were for the Cobb area. And it turns out that what they were, I thought I'd gone to heaven. In fact, I was so scared of having that much in, I would, they let me take them home. Wow. Nope, that didn't happen again. And when I looked at him, I thought, I, don't, I can't take all these home. What happens if something happens to me? Yeah, right. So I took them home in thirds. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, I, and I told him when I took them home, I catalog everything for them. So if you see all the numbers in here, the numbers are all something, they're not in order. Because I couldn't put them together. I just reached into the box picked up one, read it, wrote down where it was in the category, and I put a little sticker. That's all I did was put a little gum sticker on it so I didn't damage anything. And, I, and the only ones that I ever co that I copied were the road ones. I didn't copy all of them, which I think some, that's been 15 years ago. But I think that the museums now have enough clout that they could get together and they could go say, I want to look at those records. And I, and I have a list of all the records for you in the categories. And, and a brief description of what everyone, so it took me a week to read those things. It took, and it was, it's 1,144 documents. Oh and, but it was only one carton, and it's sitting in there. And as far as I know, it's still locked up back in there again. Nobody wants to touch it. And, uh, but they, there were, uh, let's see. okay, so that's what the records are and that's what this is. So this is all double-sided here of everything that I got. And the records then are, let me see. And of course, like I say, I cataloged them, and okay, most of the records are from 1848 to 1839. And those, most of those are uh, county clerk records, which are mostly petitions. Like I said, everything did a petition. And they're all, full, and the petition is folded like a legal document. That's how they stored everything. And then, but there's a lot of other stuff in there. They, they go all the way up to uh, uh, 1900. So there's stuff in there other county records that were put in there. And now we're going to come, how do I think they got into the vault? We come back to Tracy Scott again. When I worked for the, uh, the county, most of my work was out in the field on bridges and, 
but I occasionally would come in and do some work. And I distinctly, but I can't remember the conversation, that they salvaged some records from the basement of the annex. Now, most people don't know it either, but the courthouse you see now used to have a three-story concrete annex in the back of it, attached to the building. Ugly son of a gun. All they've done during the Depression on the WPA. Anyways, three-story. The bottom story had the recorder's office and another office I can't remember. The second story had the courthouse for the, the county. Judge Jones had an office and the surveyor had an office and the other side was a long office for the guys who worked in the road deal. And the upstairs was the jail. That has all been removed and there are I haven't seen a picture of that building yet in all my come back. I know there's one, there's got to be one, but I think everybody wanted to forget that was there. <laughs> <laughs> but it was an ugly, ugly building. And I never, like I say, never even went in the judge's chamber, never went upstairs. I did go in the recorder's office because I had to do business in there. But down in, underneath that, there is a, it was described to me as a dirt floor that a lot of records got stored there and got water damage. I believe Tracy Scott salvaged those documents. 